It's time for New Wellness TV with Dr. Lee. Join your host, the accomplished Dr. Sherilyn Lee, as she welcomes the leading experts in health and well-being as they explore the advancements in natural health, physical fitness, nutrition, integrative medicine, and self-discovery. Good day, everyone, or evening, whatever time you're use, listening to this wonderful show and this broadcast. I am so honored, as I, I always am, to have such wonderful guests on my show. And today, our show is very dear to my heart, because we're going to be speaking about the heart, but it's dear to my heart because of my own health history, because of my father had heart disease, and I lost a very dear cousin at 45 from heart disease. And so I have dove into, you know, the study of cardiovascular health, which is part of my nonprofit for early screening and early detection, which is so important. So my show today, I have a very distinguished guest, and I think you may be one of the only ones that I know in the world. I know, I know Sinatra, you know, some other people, but you're the one that I know personally and your personal touch and what you do on our topic today is dealing with cardiovascular health, and you, I mean, you're an integrative cardiovascular doctor, you know, and I had to put integrated along with holistic because some people said, well, what is that? You know, and I asked them, do you know what it is? <laughs> you should know what it is. For this show today, I want everyone, please, get a pen and paper because we're going to be giving you some advice and information that you need to know. These are things you need to know. We have to really educate ourselves. We have to educate ourselves, and that's why my one and only dear friend, <laughs> Dr. Howard Elkins, is here today, cardiologist, on the show today. Thank you. Thank you. You're okay, Thank you. Know, you. You know, it's a blessing for you to take off time, because I know you have a very, very busy practice to be here. And I, you know, I don't go through and read the whole long bio because we have so much information to give that people will Google you. We're heard on television as well as TV, um, uh, streaming live on, face, on Facebook and streaming live on our YouTube, iHeart. And as Tony tells me, we have so many platforms that I usually forget them all. Um, but I'm just so grateful. So in dealing with, you know, most people don't know what is a integrative holistic cardiologist. I want you to tell them. Well, I actually looked it up, okay? I looked it up in Webster's <laughs> Dictionary. Okay. So they said integrative means to integrate. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and the term originated back in 1862. Yeah. Which is really interesting. It means to bring together. Exactly. So what I do as a holistic integrative cardiologist is kind of I utilize my traditional cardiology training, and I go outside the box whenever necessary. You're, you're really outside the box, yes. Right. <laughs> That's <laughs> yes. kind of how I explain it. You know, yes. it's, it's, um, I'm not like, okay, you have this, we give you this drug. It's like I actually think about what I'm doing and give options whenever I can. Yes. And um, so that's kind of what we do. Yes. And, of course, I'm also – it's a functional medicine approach. And so for your listeners, functional medicine is actually – we're actually looking for the cause of something. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't just put a Band-Aid on it. I mean, like I put stents in people's arteries, but that's just the beginning. That will save them for during a particular event or a heart attack, but right. it won't be the end all be all. Yes, and I, I and we say root cause as well, the root cause. I, I recently have taken it a different to a different level based on uh, my daughter who works with me who has her master's in nutrition. So we're going beyond the root, right. you know, because we got to go to the soil. <laughs> right. We got to go beyond the root. So that's what we have started to do um, in looking at what's going on with the person. And so uh, the reason why I say I want everyone to have their pens and papers ready, because we're going to give you some information as it relates to lab testing, lab values. You know, go back and pull out your own blood tests. And if you have not have had them done, uh, I always refer people to Life Extension for some of their mm -hmm. lab. And you can see us. Do not try to, we're going to be talking about some supplements for different conditions. But keep in mind, all like CoQ10s, uh, L-carnitine for the heart, mm -hmm. all these things, they're not created equal. So make sure you're speaking with a, a licensed healthcare practitioner like myself, Dr. Elkins, uh, who is an MD. Make sure that you are getting the right supplement. 
because again, they're not created equal. And that's important. So I want everybody to make sure have your pens and paper ready. Share this show with everyone because we're going to be talking about quite a bit as it relates to cardiovascular health. And we want to first start off, just tell people, why did you choose this field out of all the fields in medicine? Why? You know, it's, it's a great, it's an interesting question. And when I was a first year medical student, and I wasn't even thinking about what I wanted to do, but when we got to the cardiovascular system, it like it just clicked. Like this does this make sense? This is about mm -hmm. memorizing. Yes, it just made sense to me. Without even thinking, I was going to be a cardiologist, and then I eventually finished medical school and went through internal medicine training. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just it just the heart came natural to me, you know, emotionally and as well as <laughs> in, in, in general interest. And you know, it's been a wonderful journey because. I've been here in cardiology when we when people would ca come in with a heart attack and we put them into intensive care unit and just yes. put an IV in and pray because we didn't have much therapy at that point. You know, some made it, but most you know, didn't. And, and pray. You, n not many people say that in the ER. <laughs> right. Put an IV and pray. Okay. Right. Because so many people didn't make it. Yeah, and then I, yeah. then I was there when we gave, started doing clot-busting drugs when I was a fellow. And then we started doing... Now, if we, you come to the hospital, you have a great chance of surviving because we bring you right to the cath lab and we try to open the artery up. And that's been a process of like 30 some years. You know, something just happened with a very dear friend of mine. I just ran into her recently. Um, and she didn't know she had a stroke. And um, until she, she called the paramedics, luckily, the person that came knew what was happening. And then she said, I'm not going to the hospital. And not knowing what was happening with her body because she didn't see in the mirror what was happening. And they got her there, and they were able to. I was surprised at this particular hospital. I'm not going to name the hospital. They were able to go in and, as you say, clock button mm -hmm. up and remove the clot. And actually, she has no residual of a stroke, and she went home. She looked really great. She looked really great. I couldn't believe that it happened. It's to amazing. Her. We used to say that. We still say that time equals muscle when it comes to the heart. If you have a, if you, if there's any question, you get to the hospital. Let us rule it out. And if you are a candidate, you go right to the cath lab. Same thing with a stroke victim. Before, we didn't do anything. Now, mm -hmm. if you are there within that window, they can give you a clot busting Now, what, what is that window? It's about 90 minutes. 90 minutes. Oh, that's 90. a long time. Yeah, 90 yeah, minutes. 90 minutes, okay. I mean, it's definitely 90 minutes for the... Uh, it's, well, you know, again, depends, but the sooner the better. The sooner the better. Yeah. Okay. I mean, if, even if you're there within two or three... I forgot the cutoff for stroke. Okay, and since we're speaking on that, tell people what is a cat... A cath lab. What are sure. they doing there? Okay, cath lab mm -hmm. is where we bring a patient and we actually either we sort of sort of catheter in the in the femoral in the, in the artery, radial artery in the arm or in the femoral artery in the leg, and we actually are, are, are injecting dye into the three main coronary arteries, looking for any critical blockages. Mm -hmm. If we see a blockage in the case of an acute heart attack, then we actually we try to open that artery up. So time really does equal muscle, but Again, you know, 30 years ago, this is, I, I would have never known, 30, 40 years ago when I was a student, we didn't have mm -hmm. this. So it's just been a fascinating time for me to see the entire evolution of heart care. And I know some people will say, you know, <laughs> you're introducing a dye and we're holistic. But, you know, when you look at the flip side, my life right. or death in this point, you can always detox and do many, many things right. later. Right now, it's about saving your life. You're absolutely right. It's I can't all about saving that. your life because a lot of people say, well, I'm not going because I'm not going to have that dye put in my body and have these side effects. Well, then you might not make it. Right. You might not make it. Or if you do make it, you could be have residual problems, uh, stroke, uh, brain damage. Right. You know, uh, you don't want that. And you make a great heart. point because... You know, like I'm traditionally trained, but I look outside the box and I do integrative things, right? Yes, yes. But I also have to, and I'm a member of certain functional medicine groups on, on Facebook and so forth. And so people are always like down, downgrading statins, downgrading this. But there are point, there are times that you need traditional medicine. Like if you have acute appendicitis. But I don't, I don't you, think there's ever a point somebody needs statin. I'm sorry. Right. You may be right on that one. But anyway, okay. <laughs> but, but when it comes to a heart attack or stroke, you're right. You just got to yeah. get it. And I say that meaning, I say I don't feel there's ever a time only because this is why I have the nonprofit for early prevention and right. early detection. So if you find out things early, <laughs> but if you find out I'm too late, you're going to have to do something right, right away. So right. if you find out early, you can take care of it early. Now, I want to get into, we talk about statins, and we know we use it for cholesterol. I want to share this one story with a lady who came to me, and I knew her husband. They were coming in frequently, and she called me one day, and she said, my cholesterol level is like 400 and something. 
And I'm thinking, for her, I mean, how could that be? I mean, you don't have that kind of diet. I mean, I know you. And she said, yeah, and the hospital now is giving me a statin. And I'm like, you know what? Why don't you come in and let's do some things? And uh, we did. You know what it was? This is why you have to listen to people. Take a thorough history. Mm-hmm. Come to find out, because everything turned around in like three weeks. Then she said, oh, I really forgot to tell you during the history that I had eaten shrimp for a whole month because they were on sale. Wow. So it was the shrimp. And then she had her blood taken right away that caused her cholesterol level to be sky high. Wow. So you got to know, to me, it, I learned a, valu- a very valuable lesson when I you know, do a person's interview, when they come in and say, okay, my cholesterol level is high. What have you eaten in the last 30 days? What have you eaten in the last week? Right. That this is what caused hers to be high. Good point. If you had a high fat diet and something, you know, and then they drew your blood, maybe you weren't even fasting, as they say. So is it still necessary for people to fast, doctor? You know, there is a debate about that. A lot of people I say heard. it doesn't really matter, but I think it does matter for me because I'm looking at triglycerides, I'm looking at fa- fasting insulin levels, I'm looking at things that really mm-hmm. need to be tested in the fasting state. So as an integrative cardiologist, I like them to be fasting. Uh, but if you're just doing a regular Well, doesn't screen, it take 20 minutes for when you eat something with fat for it to get into the blood system? Pretty much, yeah. So if, you're gonna, if a person was on their way to the doctor's office to have blood drawn, and they decided they want to have a donut and some other stuff, which we should not be doing, but right. say, for instance, they did, and they had a, a piece of meat, like a lot of people will do, right. and then they walked in to have blood drawn, drawn. Wouldn't that be a false? Yes, yeah. A false elevation? Right. It, right. I mean, I've had patients that like they'll take like they drink a lot of wine the night before. Their triglyceride level will be high. So wow, with wine. Yes, yes. Oh my goodness. Burns, okay. Alcohol burns the sugar, right? Yes, exactly. So I try to tell them just eat normally. Stop it. You know. I don't think it has to be a 12-hour fast. But, that, you know, that's a really good point with the triglyceride, right. the wine and the triglyceride being high. Right, because triglycerides can vary significantly according to what you ate the day before. The, the day, day before. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so you should almost almost fast a little longer. I but think so. It helps yeah. me as a physician to be able to give you a more clear interpretation yeah. of the results. You want to know it. So I, this is where the pen and paper come, come in handy with everyone. You know, we started off with normal levels for blood tests. So I want us to kind of hit... Um, cardiovascular screening, and what are some of those normal switch should they look like? And I want people to, if you had blood tests done, make sure your doctor is, is ordering with your C-reactive protein, your homeocysteine, right. and then you're going to break down the other particles that they right. should be looking for. And if they're not doing that, then you should probably see someone like myself or Dr. Elkins. Right. You know, it's really important because we provide um, lab tests that's going to break all that down for you. So, Dr. Elkins, I want you to tell people, what is now? You know, we first started off with cholesterol level was 200 was okay. Then I saw someone who, who is a dear friend of mine who is a physician who said, oh, no, I want to see, see your cholesterol level at 100. I said, at 100? I won't even know how to find my house. Are you kidding? 100? So, what is now the, what, what is a normal range well, for cholesterol? Well, you got to remember that what, when cardiologists publish studies, they're talking about the average population. Well, the average population is on a sad, and sad American diet. And they're sick, yes. <laughs> um, so they're, like, they're pre-selecting a, a sick, a relatively a sick population. Yes. So um, I do not really concur with all those recommendations. Now, if you, for secondary, let's say you've had a heart attack, you've had a stroke, you've had a stent, you've had bypass, we are more strict yes. on cholesterol requirements, but now they're saying you can get as low as an LDL, which is, LDL for your listeners is lousy, and HDL tends to be what we call healthy, but it's not as simple as all that. But We're going to go a little bit slower, because I want people to hear yes. that LDL. LDL, I call it the lousy cholesterol, Okay, but although it's not quite that. It's good to remember it that yeah, way, it's a too. it's good though. mnemonic, and HDL is healthy. Okay. Okay, good. so now they are saying if you, if you follow that classification of having had an event, or a stent, mm-hmm. or a bypass... You, you should get below 60 now. But every year, it tends to be lower and lower. 60 and cholesterol level? LDL, LDL. LDL. Okay. So your cholesterol would be like, I mean, at 130, 140. I mean, it's still pretty low, right? Mm. Now, does that mean I try to aim for that? No, because I look at the grand picture. Cholesterol is one piece of the pie. So like you say, you already mentioned, a three-reactor protein, homocysteine. We're going to say that nice and slow because I want people to yes. really get that. <laughs> homocysteine. You need to know what are your levels and what is the normal should be. What should the normal be? I like it to be less than 10. 
less than Some 10. people say less than nine or eight. I, I like to see minus five and right. less, really, because what does it mean? It means inflammation. It's inflammation, right. Yeah, and homeocysteine is dealing with, what, three major vitamins, correct? Right, right. so basically to, it's very easy to treat because there's a combination of three vitamins, B6, B12, and B9, which is folate. Yeah. Those three together in a certain strength can help lower homocysteine levels. But, you know, the interesting thing is that modern medicine, traditional medicine, hasn't really taken on the topic of homocysteine. They kind of downplay it. I know. And I think it's because there's no pharmaceutical that will treat it. Yeah, three, it's so three, easy. Three B vitamins, right, yeah. Three B vitamins. <laughs> yeah. We talk about a pretty non costly treatment, right? Mm -hmm. I treat it. I, I think it's a piece of the pie, and um, I think it's important. Right, and we, we treat it as well. But I want to ask you, when we're looking at homeocysteine and we're looking at the three, three B vitamins, we do know there's a genetic component to this. Um, so the genetic component to this, if a person is not methylating, right. and I'm going to have you explain more on that, um, since I have you here in okay. the audience. Well, there's this enzyme that we can, well, first of all, there's a big genetic test now called MTHFR. Yes. Some of you have probably heard of it. It's methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase. Yes. It's an enzyme actually, and that allows you to methylate correctly, which is a chemical process that your body uses to detoxify drugs and things like that. So let's say you have an MTHFR variant, and I have it. 60% of the population has it. Yes. It's that common. But I'm one of those that actually doesn't, it's, the, it's not, the gene isn't being expressed, although I do have it. Mm -hmm. um, so my homocysteine levels are normal. But again, it, it is a genetic basis. It's not related to diet. It's not related to exercise. It's not related to body size. Mm -hmm. It's either, it's usually a genetic variant, but it's extremely common. Um, but the B vitamins in combination can lower it quite nicely. Yes, but when you take the right one. So now they have... A methylated B, right? B twelve fo and folic acid. It's very important. Like, mm -hmm. for, for example, folic acid is synthetic. Yes. So we don't like that. S listen to that. Listen to that. Acid is in every ingredient. It's going to say folic acid, and for good reason because what they're trying to do is to prevent neural tube defects in pregnant women. Mm -hmm. But if you if you have the genetic tendency, or if you're MTHFR, you don't want to take um, folic acid. You want to take you want to take uh, folate, but it should be a methylated form. Yes. And I actually formulated a prep exactly for this that has methylated B12, B, B, um, B9, which is folate, B12, and um, B6. Yeah, I've, I've been using it for a good while because I had a lady who had uh, multiple uh, miscarriages, yes. multiple uh, strokes, and um, she's young. She's really very, very young. Point, because yeah. um, I'm glad you mentioned that because people that are MTHFR, they tend to have a higher incidence of miscarriages. Miscarriages, yes. So now when I have someone that says, well, I ask them, do you have any miscarriages? Yeah, I have like three. And they're almost always going to be MTHFR. And also, in the as you get older, it can be a source of dementia. So uh, elevated homocysteine levels. So why would we not want to test something if we know that it can be toxic to the brain? <laughs> and it's a very exp inexpensive product. Yes. Very inexpensive to get things back balanced. And again, I, I always refer people so far over to Life Extension because you can order those tests and look at those results. You know, not that you want to practice medicine on yourself. You don't want to do that. But at least you can get an idea, okay, before I go make this appointment, I can have some things at right. hand, you know, to become a no more knowledgeable about what is happening to my own health, Yes, which so is important. Life Extension, I think they um, they, they work with LabCorp. Mm -hmm. so it's, they do. It, it's, it's pretty well priced. Another option is from a lab called SpectraCell. And they have I a, use them a lot, too. And they have a cardiometabolic panel that's like $140. You that can't cost, beat that. That would cost $1,000 by Quest. It, it, it is fun, it's phenomenal. And we offer, you offer that and so do we. But the thing is, I want to go through now, <clears throat> if a, perf a person think they might have or family history of cardiovascular disease, what are the what are the main lab tests they should okay, know? Great point. Because of inflammation and other things too. Right. Okay, go ahead. Well, a lot of people come to me for that one reason. They know mm -hmm. that I'm integrative, they know that I'm functional medicine, mm -hmm. and they know that I'm preventative minded. So 
I will probably the, my 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 lab of choice if they have insurance because it's cheaper is I like Boston Heart Diagnostics because they really specialize in cardiovascular, uh, but Quest uh, bought out about seven years ago they bought out Berkeley Heart Lab right and then they most recently bought out Cleveland Heart Lab. But we really want to focus on what are the tests. The tests itself. Not not so much That's the lab. okay yeah the okay tests. so if they have a positive human history, and I'm going to check their standard cholesterol panel. But I really want to know the particle size of the LDL. So remember, LDL. And that is has lousy. a name. Yes. It has a name. So I want you to give them the name. That's why I want people to have pen and paper. Okay. So they can write down the name of these tests. Okay. So it's called, you would want it, it's called a, it's going to be a subclassification of particle size. So whether it's HDL, which is healthy, or LDL, which we classify as lousy, you want to know the particle size. Um, and that's what these specialized labs will do for you. Um, now you have to go. Your doctor may not even know what these are. <laughs> uh, cardiologists don't care to know what these are. <laughs> I know. Um, so you <laughs> have to kind of pick and choose. Mm -hmm. You got to say, I want to know my particle size. Mm -hmm. If they don't know what that means, then you might want to look elsewhere. Yeah. Because I think it's important if you're dealing with prevention, if you're dealing with someone who has a positive family history, because we want to be able to prevent this stuff. And why? Because the therapy is different. Exactly. Exactly. And I and I'm very thorough as well. That's why you and I are such good friends. Right. And, and, and when I see things you know, out of my scope, because I'm not a cardiologist, I refer them over to you. And you so graciously came on board to work with us under our nonprofit, which is dealing with vascular health. So I want to thank you. Uh -oh. Shake your hand. <laughs> and thank you so much for being part of this. I, I've been on this journey for years, haven't received a dime. Everything has been coming out of my own pocket, so I do the carotid artery studies. But in looking at... This, what are some of the other? I mean, you should have the whole panel, yes. And yes. They, they, it's really important that they know their complete uh, CBC right. with differential, and that's right. really important. Um, so those are mainstream right. kind of labs, but I like to look at two as fiber, fiber, fibrinogen, right? So then I look at you, right? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. we, we, so we, first we have the particle sizes, whether it's HDL or LDL. Once we have that, we also want to see. I, I call. I want to do what's called an inflammatory profile. Yes. Because our, inflammation is the bane of our existence as we age. I don't care if it's heart disease, cancer, autoimmune disorders, or Alzheimer's. They all four of the biggies of aging have one thing in common: inflammation. Inflammation. So yes. So CRP, C-reactive protein, mm -hmm. and fibrinogen are non-specific markers for inflammation. Then we have two specific markers. Well, I'll just mention them. You can write them down, but. LP, PLA2, okay, and then myeloperoxidase, or MPO. You can go by NPO. NPO, yes. So yes. those two are more specific for vascular information. So those are a real marker for me. I'm going to say, you know, not only do you have inflammation, but you've got inflammation in your vascular system. So we really got to get mm -hmm. to work here. And because we have a lining inside of those vessels. So I want you to talk a little bit about that, too, because right. that lining inside of your vessel, and I'm going to turn it back over to you, is so important to know what's going on. And a lot of things you can pick up um, through lab work. Right. So go ahead. So that's called the endothelium. It's mm -hmm. one cell thick. Yeah. And um, as long as that, that, that one cell thick layer is intact, I don't care what your cholesterol is because nothing's going to happen. But once there's a disruption in that inner lining, and that could be from smoking, uncontrolled hypertension, homocysteine, um, and a lot of other environmental factors, possibly heavy metals. Once there's a dis disruption in that barrier, that, mm -hmm. that, lays, that, that sets the stage for inflammation. Then if you have the LDL small particle size, which is more toxic than the large particle size, that can get in there, and then you've got inflammation and eventually plaque. Right. And you have to keep in mind, we're talking about cardiovascular disease, and people forget, you know, there's vascular and there's vessels in the brain. Right. That are very small. So this is the reason why we have this wonderful show today, so that you can know this up front. If you know what your lab tests are, your liver function tests, because because of the cholesterol level right. in the liver, and then the phase one, phase two, as far as detoxing and, and right. dealing with the liver, these things are very important for a person right. to know. And those things you can find out from your practitioner, but if you never had any blood tests done, never had any kidney function tests done, and find out what's going on, what's your GFR, and see how things are filtrating right. through the kidney. If you have a heart problem, you know, the, the arteries and veins didn't stop there in the heart. They right. didn't stop in the heart. Right. It's going to be a whole system. It's the and, whole body. And the longer I've been in this field, the more I realize 
I thought everything's connected. Yes. So, uh, so okay, so we look at the particle sizes, we look at there any, any inflammation, and we also have to see, is there a metabolic problem going on? And that's what I really see a lot of, because um, what I'm looking for is diabetes, prediabetes, metabolic syndrome, and all these are on the rise. Now, if you go back 20 years ago, in the late 90s, so we were all recommending, what was the diet? Everything was like low fat, high carb, okay? Because that, that was the thinking of the day. Uh, low the, fat, the, yes. Well, low fat, healthy diet, right? Mm-hmm. So it was intimate non fat brownies and all these fat free dressings for yourself. <laughs> I it was know. All full, it was all full of garbage, I right? I know, we were all there, and, and, and especially with the. Uh, the sugar-free oh, diet yeah. sodas. Oh my goodness! Yeah. I just thought I was in heaven. Here's right. many, many. I was a teenager then yeah. <laughs> when they said that. I'm like, oh gee, I can but, have that but what much happened soda. What happened is that the country got fatter mm-hmm. than ever before, and we have more diabetes. Diabetes is now an epidemic. So that yes. is the worst diet um, to prescribe to patients. So now, just to keep in mind, obesity rate used to be 32 percent in this country. Now we're up to 50 percent. That's obesity. Overweight. Uh, is now over 75%. Yeah, and give the range when they consider you overweight versus obese. Right. There's a range, so give that to our audience. Um, let's see. I'm not that great the numbers, but it uh, depends if you're looking at BMI. But I think if it's over 30, they consider it obese. But it does, BMI does not take into consideration your body composition. Like, I'm muscular, so my BMI is going to be higher than someone who's Weighs the same as me, but it's got well, fat. Well, de- depending on what type of BMI test you do, because I do right. one that measures the body, lean body mass, uh, fat, right, along with fluid, hydration, intercellular, right. so extracellular, do biological b- b- right. Yeah, so, that's be more I, yeah, exact. that's that's give me a better picture, right. So when people are losing weight or gaining weight you and all tell, these other you things, you want to look at the whole picture of that person, right, which is so important, that's not just do a pinch test and you know or measurements. Because right. that's not going to take into effect. Like you, you're right. very muscular right. because you go to the gym, and it's not going to take into effect that. Right. But when you do the BN, we call it B, B, M, BIA, right. the BIA test in right. our, in our right. office. It's a much better is, test. See, um, yeah, the, the other one is just an estimate based on your height and weight. Yeah. So it's, it's an estimate. Yeah, there but it right. is. There it is. Tony, is thank you. That's the one we use, in, and that's the exact company that I use. All right. Yeah. Um, so, that's, so that's, again, so... Lipid subclassification of the particle sizes. Let's look at inflammation. Let's look at the the metabolic profile. Exactly. There's also a couple genetic tests we can look at. So I look at all these things and come up with the fact is, okay, is this patient high risk, moderate risk, or low risk? Yes. Uh, And then I do sometimes do a coronary artery calcium scan because that will help determine where do they have any calcium in their coronary arteries? Yes, I heard um, death by calcium. That was one of right. uh, Dr. Thomas Levy did right. a book on death by calcium because people were just getting too much. Right. You know, so to do the scan, tell, tell me more about the scan. The scan is done. I, I, I love it. It's Now, it's usually not covered by insurance. Why? Because it's a screening test. They'll cover a bypass, but they won't cover something for screening. Oh, my. It's about $190, um, but it's five-minute test. You go in there fully clothed, no IVs, and it detects the calcium in the three main coronary arteries. Is this done with a camera? <clears throat> How is it done? I'm sorry. It's a CT scan. Oh, it's a CT it's scan. A, okay. It's a, you know, it's not a test you would do every day, but it's, it gets me a base, and I'll tell you where it comes in handy. So anyway, what I'll find out is, okay, this person's got this, they have a calcium score. So the ideal score is zero, right? You don't want to have any calcium in your arteries. Right. So you no. get a score of, is it 20? Is it 200? Is it 2,000? So the scope is very wide. And then uh, at where I usually bring my patients, they have a huge database of 30,000 patients. So they'll take your score and compare it with, with other, let's 50-year-old males, or if you're a female, 50-year-old females. So then, you, then we know where you are in, in re- reference to people of your age group. Mm-hmm. And so if it's like 20%, I say, okay, we, we, have a le- we have a little leeway here. If they're 80, 90%, I'm saying, we gotta really work. Yeah. Because yeah. this is not good. So it how do does, how do you work on getting? Well, I, I'm not big on chelation. I don't think you. Suggest I don't do that. chelation. I I'm really basic lifestyle management. Yeah, and that's what it is. It's lifestyle. You start with lifestyle, which my yeah. daughter's been pounding in my head. Let's just have a lifestyle clinic. Right. But it's it's you if you that's where we start. You have to start with lifestyle. But by the time people find you, they they have all these problems. Right. You know, and it's, this is why they're I advanced. Said, but the time they see me, I see advanced disease. You see advanced. So I, I want to, uh, I've had one 
only because someone pushed me, pushed me, pushed me, because uh, an angiogram. So um, I want you to just kind of share with people, what are, what are the benefits of angiogram and how is that done? An angiogram is an invasive procedure. I think we, we referenced it at the beginning of the show. That's what we do when we're trying to when present with an acute heart attack. Right, right. But we do it also diagnostically. Mm -hmm. But first of all, I have to have a huge, this is when experience comes in, a huge index yes. of suspicion that this person really has something going on. Or I've done already a non-invasive test, like a certain type of stress test. If the stress test is positive, then there's and if it's pretty if it's if it's significantly positive then there's a high incidence that it's going to be something real and then mm -hmm. angiogram will come in handy right or if they have classic symptoms I'm going to bypass it the stress test right if it's that simple because why would I want to put them through a stress test if they're having chest pain at rest right you know so again it has to do with you know, that, that history, your patients, yeah, you your, your history and what's the his, going on. The history, yeah, it's so important. Mm -hmm. Now, now we're going to kind of move in a little bit into hypertension because we know that now there's so many people been diagnosed with high blood pressure, and those numbers there has also dropped. The yes. normal range used to be 120 over 80, and then I saw one time it was seven, 117 over 70 something. I don't know if it's went any lower. Uh, well. In but. 2017, I think it was November 2017, the Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology came out with a joint statement. Okay, so anything above 130 for the top number, mm -hmm. systolic, or 80 for the bottom number is considered abnormal. That means if you have 131 over 81, you're hypertensive. Now, does that mean I treat all these patients to goal? No. Because if I did that, they'd have to be probably on three medications. They'd have to be seeing me every six weeks. Um, it's crazy. So again, it happens to be, I, I, this is when the integrative common sense approach takes, is so important. I'll look at the patient and say, okay, if you're younger, you know, we're really going to try to get this down. It behooves you to get this, these numbers down. I'll work hard on it. On an 80, 90 year old, I'm not going to try to get those kind of numbers because they may actually have an untoward right. event. You know, years ago, I, I heard that it was the systolic top number was 100 plus your age. Right. They used to do that years ago. So I said, well, for a person who is 80, you know, that would be 180 would be okay for them. And we know that's not right. I, I'm sure it was a cutoff. Right. But um, so many things have changed through the years with blood pressure. And the sad thing with a lot of blood pressure medicine, what I feel, if a person is on a blood pressure medicine, because so many of your uh, medicines are side effects, it's cancer now. And we know that to be true is in our physician death reference, you know. Right. So what we want to do, what I do, is make sure that their immune system, again, inflammation, mm -hmm. keep those inflammation markers down, and do everything we can to prevent cancer from happening because that is one of the side effects of a lot of the well-known blood pressure medicines. Right. So, you know, um, when it comes to blood pressure, I, I don't have a cutoff, like, it's got to be this or that. Um, okay. I really look at it as an individual at this point. A, a very individual basis. Did she just go through a divorce or <laughs> lose her job? Or really? fire, exactly. You know? Well, that's important. Yeah, you got to know that. Life, yeah, you know? exactly. <laughs> because I'll have a patient that's been stable for a long period of time. Then they come in and say, you know, I'm spiking all the time now. Then I say, okay, what's going on? Mm -hmm. Is it job related? Is it family related? Is it relationship related? Yes. And you really, is it hormone related? Uh, most definitely, so thyroid, all, all, all that. these things to take an important role. So again, history, history, history. Um, and there's other things. If you have mild hypertension, first of all, I don't treat someone with medicine the first time I see them, unless it's off the wall high. Uh, high five. Okay. High five. You know why? Because that's what is stated when I was in training. When I was in training as a physician assistant and NP nurse practitioner, it was part of our training that it should be three consecutive visits. Exactly. Because that first visit, but unless they're in danger, you know, you want to get it down right, right then. But, you know, it could have been traffic on the freeway or yeah. they had too much coffee and too much caffeine we know that'll raise it prior right. to you walking in the door it could be white coat syndrome right so i'm so happy to hear you say that because everybody is putting yeah. them first day on medication never i mean i i mean i have patients that would go i had a patient recently came to me was at the emergency room blood pressure everybody's blood pressure is high in the emergency room okay that's a known <laughs> fact i don't even look at blood pressure in the emergency room unless it's 200 right okay uh so they said, okay, go see Dr. Elkin because, you know, but in the meantime, start this medication. Because the person was smart enough and said, I don't, I didn't start it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, 
and even the first time someone sees me, I don't get too excited because you know, I'm a new physician to them. They don't know me. They had to drive to see me. It might be a little elevated. <laughs> but I do exactly what you do. I do three consecutive yes. um, blood pressure measurements. And what period of time? Like I, I do it like if they can come in every week or every two weeks, uh-huh. I want to. I'd like to make an assessment within a month, and then what I might also Good. do is an echocardiogram, and I'll tell you why. Because if the heart muscle is thick, that's going to tell me it's long standing. Because now we say heart muscle, so what part of the heart? We look into the left ventricle, right. correct? Okay. So you got to remember, like I'm a bodybuilder, right? I want my biceps and my pecs to be thicker. I don't want my heart to be thicker. <laughs> But no. the heart's a muscle. Yeah, exactly. So it's going to respond. If mm-hmm. you have a, a persistent elevation of blood pressure, it's got to compensate. So it compensates by getting thicker, and which we don't really necessarily well, And, want. you know, I, this is what I have said, and, it, you know, let me know. But the blood is leaving the body from the left ventricle of right. the heart. And the heart is a muscle. So right. you kind of got this kind of going on. Right. If the blood pressure is high, meaning the pressure, the heart has to do this to try to push it is a muscle so that left ventricle enlarges. Right. It's now, thicker. I, first, I, first it thickens. Thicker, thicker. And mine was able to, I did have that. Oh, really? Okay. But it atrophied after I got the blood pressure down and went back to normal. Yes, it can. Yeah. I mean, and, I, and I was, I thought, what kind of doctor is this telling me it's normal? This is many, many years ago. And I'm like, it's normal. And I had left ventricular hyperplasia yeah, years you, ago. You can, with, but yeah, it did. It, it can be reversed. Blood, blood pressure went down to normal. And they said, oh, no, your EKGs are normal. I'm like, really? Echo's normal? Hmm. Then I found out through another cardiologist that's what happened. I was so happy to hear that. So then I started sharing that with other people. If it's happening, as long as you keep it down, you know, this can go back to normal. Absolutely. Because you're going to have problems. Now, what is pulmonary hypertension? Okay, that's another big one. So pulmonary hypertension, if you look at I wish I had a map of the heart for you, but there's the right... Oh, there'll be one on the screen, so just keep talking. Okay, there's the right (laughs) side of the heart and the left side of the heart. So the right side of the heart pumps blood to the lungs to get oxygen, okay? But it has to go by way of pulmonary artery to the lungs. Then it comes back to the left side of the heart, where it's going to be eventually pumped through the aorta and goes all over your body. So there are certain things that cause a pressure increase and a thickening of that pulmonary artery that leads to the lungs. Now, it could be a, it could be related to um, certain medications. It could be something called idiopathic pulmonary hypertension. It could be related to multiple blood clots in the lung with back pressure. Mm. There's a whole different, there's a whole bunch of possibilities there. Uh, there's also left-sided heart disease can eventually lead to right-sided heart disease. So, um, so that's pulmonary hypertension. Now, it was uniformly fatal in the past uh, because we don't really know. If they don't know what causes it in most cases, that's what we call it. Idiopathic means we don't really know. Um, I used to use another term. It was like idiot, but it's okay. <laughs> right. So, but there are medications um, mm-hmm. that, that, and that again needs to be diagnosed. You need to go to someone who knows what they're doing to make sure the diagnosis is clear cut. But there are, you know, there are medications out there today. I don't think it's something that's necessarily avoidable um, uh, because we don't always know what causes it, but yeah. it should be able to be at least With pul- treated. pulmonary hypertension, right. yes. Yeah, because I, I heard some people call me and said, I have it. And I asked them, number one, how were you diagnosed? Right. That's the first question. You know, how were you diagnosed with this? So it's basically, that's a good question. So an echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound of the heart, is mm-hmm. going to give you... No a, radiation. Right. No radiation. And totally non-invasive. No needles. No needles. Painless. And it's, it's a very easy kind of a screening test for permanent hypertension. We can actually measure the pressure. Uh, but then if we really want to clinch the diagnosis, we do what's called a right side cath. And we actually measure the pressure to be sure. Mm. So that's the that's the kind of the gold standard. Okay. Like an angiogram is a gold standard for diagnosing coronary disease. A right side heart cath measuring pre- pressures is going to be the the um, wonderful. Not that you have to always do that, right? If it's clear cut and the, the you know mm-hmm. again looking at the history, you wouldn't need to do that. But in, in equivocal cases, right. we would do a right heart cath. Okay, and and let's since we on echoes, people with heart murmurs. Now, I want you to, and there's so many types. If you can kind of, t- what are the most serious types of heart mur- murmurs? You could be congenital and could kind of be bur- born right. with a heart murmur. Well, I want you to go in more details and explain what is a heart murmur and the different types of heart okay. murmurs. Basically, I know it's based on where it's located in the heart. Right. But I want you to go through that. Okay. Thank right. you. So the, there's four heart valves because we have four heart chambers. And usually th- these valves open and close so that the blood can go from one chamber to the other. Uh, but 
the important thing is that there should be, to go from one chamber to the other, you shouldn't hear a sound when you put the stethoscope on. So you've all heard the lub-dub, 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 lub-dub. That's because there's two sounds to the cardiac cycle. But if you have a lub, psh, you know, a, a wishing sound or swishing sound, or a sound that doesn't belong there, then you've got a murmur. And that actually comes from the French, meaning, I think, sound. So, uh, but that's my stethoscope. But if I really want to get more specific and more information, I look at the echo, which is excellent. Again, non-invasive. So then we want to see, is it what valve it is in? So probably one that we see mostly in, as we get older is the aortic valve. Because if that's getting calcified... And this is the aortic valve in the chest, not abdominal. Right. Yeah, so keep in mind there's, there's two. So if that gets really tight, then you have a hard time getting blood going through that, which means... The whole body's going to suffer. That's a, and that's something that is usually slowly progressive. I have several patients uh, with aortic, we call it aortic stenosis or tightening of that aortic valve. So that. Well, what are some of the symptoms a person might have with a, a, a aortic valve stenosis, meaning yeah. that the valve is becoming okay. Well, until it gets severe, they could have absolutely no symptoms. I had a patient with a huge gradient. Or, 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 you know, ab much abnormal valve without any symptoms. But usually the ones that we worry about, chest pain, shortness of breath, dizziness, or passing out. Those are three ominous signs. Mm. Then you have to act. Um, and we used to actually wait until those happened before we operated. But now more and more information has come out. The research that we should intervene a little earlier than before they have those symptoms. Yeah. Um, so a lady, a lady called me just this week, and she has all three of those symptoms. Wow. All three. That she, she, she needs to be seen. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to refer over to yeah. you. Then, uh, yeah. It's so you can do her echo and do everything at one location. Right. So that's a stenosis. That, so that, that is a pressure overload because the, the, the blood can't exit the heart. So you, it's going to get thick, like we mm -hmm. mentioned with hypertension. Mm -hmm. Then we have these, we call it regurgitation murmurs, in which blood's going backwards as well as forwards. And those uh, we pick up very well with the ultrasound, the echocardiogram. And those are a little more... Uh, they're little, they're, they could be difficult because uh, the patients don't have to have any symptoms at all. They usually okay. don't have symptoms until very, very late. So let's say it's my, the mitral valve, and we're may, looking to see how severe the valve insufficiency or regurgitation is. I watch them every year, sometimes twice a year if I have to, and see is the heart getting bigger because that may be the first sign. Yes. No symptoms at all. No symptoms at all. So because someone called me yesterday and said he was diagnosed with a heart murmur. And I said, well, what type of heart murmur? He said, oh, I don't know. And I said, well, you kind of need to, you really need to know what type of heart murmur because it's going to tell me what part of the heart. And better yet, let's get you worked up by a cardiologist. Right. You know, it's if so somebody boring. else tells you that. But I, I just want to say, um, people who have strep throat, and my understanding is that the strep organism, if you don't get rid of it, can affect the mitral valve of the heart and also the kidneys. Uh, is that still? Yeah, it can't, you know, first of all, it's so easy to diagnose strep throat these days. It's, it's easy, but small. a lot of people won't always go. Right. And they'll feel, well, I can go take something natural. And now that they feel a little better, not knowing it was strep, then these symptoms would appear later. You know, I don't think, we used to see that a lot in the old days when we you had don't see like it? mitral stenosis. Okay. Because, you know, erratic heart disease and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I don't see that anymore. Really? I don't see too much of I that. I will still run ASO titers. Really? Well, yeah, but you have when a more the, general well, practice, and you see, uh, yeah, see, I don't get too many people <laughs> acutely. They usually go to urgent care um, or sometimes emergency room, and they all get checked out there. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, if they come to me. Mm, I, I have people who have gone, and they didn't get to do a throat culture. Really? They just looked and gave them some pills. No, you shouldn't do pills without a culture. No, they had no culture because I, I asked them. I don't I like them. giving antibiotics unless you need to. I'm sure you feel the same oh, now, way. Oh, now you know it's beyond antibiotics <sighs> in Antelope Valley in pediatrics. You know what they're giving now? No, I'm afraid to find out. <laughs> Prednisone. Are you serious? I'm serious. I'm serious. I have a friend yeah. who had her daughter there that is 10 months old, and they get prednisone. I mean, it's become a very and I, I thought that was pretty when I, I use antibiotics when I need to but most of the things we talk about are viral um, and we can use other modalities other treatments more natural mm -hmm. antimicrobials and things like that yeah but I know you and I feel the same on that yes we do <laughs> yes we do so we want people to know to leave here knowing that there are really kind of two reasons why you're going to be sick 
One is going to be a deficiency in something. Mm -hmm. Secondly, it's going to be your toxic. Right. And the tox toxicity is that of what we discussed, inflammation. Right. Inflammation. In the front cover of Times Magazine some years ago, they had inflammation and the fire. Right. Remember that? I remember that cover. Yeah. So they had a long article in there in the Times talking about inflammation and all the diseases. Then you have heavy metal toxicity. Then you have other environmental. Right. Then you must deal with the emotional component. When it right. deals with heart disease, you know, is it a broken heart syndrome? Right. Because you can actually die from broken heart yes, you syndrome. Can. Yes. You can die. And, and I know several people who have passed away from broken heart right. syndrome. And so you echo exactly how I feel, why functional medicine is so important. Exactly. We're exactly. trying to figure out why. I mean, if inflammation is that rampant and that serious, you know, to ignore it, it's ridiculous. Um, so, A, we have to quell it. B, we have to figure out where's it coming from. Autoimmune exactly. disorders are on the rise. You know, why? You know. GMOs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, toxicities, GMOs, yeah. environmental. Yeah. Uh, the list goes on and Heavy on. Heavy metal. Oh, my goodness. Right. I test for it. i got to bring the machine over to your office. But yeah, it's amazing. You get the results back in less than 30 seconds of all the heavy metals. We've done I shows. I think we're thinking, it. yeah, heavy metals, mold toxicity is, mold. again, history is so important. Yes, yes. You know, but... Um, and then doing the right tests. And doing the right tests. So you just don't go in and get a CBC without getting the differential and a chemistry panel, which is just a few tests and some... Because people right. bring me their results. I'm like, what is this? I don't even have any inflammation markers, and, and these are real sick people. Nothing. No homeocysteine, no fibrinogen levels, nothing. Well, I can give you an example of what somebody's going to get when they go to the hospital and they get a stent by someone other than me. <laughs> <laughs> other um, than? They're going to come to me, and they're going to be on 80 milligrams of Lipitor. That's the maximal dose. Uh, they're going to be on aspirin. They're going to be on an antiplatelet drug. They're going to be on a beta blocker and probably also an ACE inhibitor. The first thing I do is say, okay, we're going to cut these. We're, we're going to make it simplify this list. Yes. And that's a patient who did well. I'm not necessarily talking about a patient that had a major, massive heart attack. Massive heart attack oh, is different. My. But if someone that's just the all, or that's just like a, a, it's like a boilerplate plan. Oh my goodness, it, it's really sad. This is why I'm not telling you to take your health into your own hands, but at least know your lab values, know what your blood tests, know that you've had these right. tests, the ones that we discussed is so important that you know what's going on. If you're, um, now we have, the, what is it, 5G? Yeah. You know, the 5G, I just was talking to someone, and now I understand we have 12 of those in California. Wow. We have 12 plants, and I thought they weren't coming in until later, which I don't keep up with a whole lot of it. I just know we need to do things to right. keep ourselves as, as healthy right. as possible. And then the smart meters on the homes. All of these things were affect. Right. A gentleman came into an office. I went to go visit a friend of mine one day and he had palpitations and he kept saying I have this really bad palpitation my heart is beating irregular I have these palpitations and when he came out the room from having his EKG his cell phone was in his pocket oh, yeah. over his heart and I'm thinking you guys need to do that again maybe on another date and tell him not to use his keep his phone there for the next couple of weeks and repeat it sure. unless you know something life-threatening I see but I see waitresses and, rest, 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 waitresses and restaurants Cooks behind the counter, and they got that cell phone right in their pocket. Yes, and we know that's going to affect kidney. I've seen a lot of kidney cysts brain. from the back. Uh, yeah, yeah, near the head, brain, brain tumors. They say impotence in men. Yeah, yeah. So men really should. I mean, on that note alone, you should want to leave it out your pocket. Would, yeah. You know, <laughs> exactly. So <laughs> leave it out the pocket, please. References. And the I, women with fibroid and uh, not fibroid, but more uh, uh, pelvic problems. Uh, right. But I have seen a couple of people with. And I don't know if it was related to that or not, but it was amazing how their pockets were up kind of high and they had kidney cysts on that side where they were wearing the phone. So did it cause it or not? But I tell you what, it's my body. I just don't keep it on my body right. at all, not my cell phone. Right. And that's a really no. good point. And I think, so what I've always advocated is patients become their own medical advocate, as you well know. That's yes. That's my, my whole thing. Because you need to know your medications. Now I tell people, they, oh, oh well, I'll take a blood pill or I'll take a, really? Or I'll take a, a pink pill for my sugar. It's like, okay, <laughs> okay, do you have a smartphone? And most everybody has one of these, right? Yeah. So yeah. take a snap. If you, if you don't want, you can write all your medicines under the notes section or take a snapshot. Whenever you go to a doctor or an emergency room, you should know please, your medicine. Please know your medicine. It's, a, it's part of my file. My, they, yes. And they complain, oh my goodness, I have to fill out all these questions. 
Yes, because yes, I didn't even I didn't even need to know what the cooking utensils you're cooking in. Right. We ha- we're almost out of time. I'm gonna have to bring you back, <laughs> but I want you to look into the eyes of that person sitting in front of you, and in 30 seconds, what do you want them to leave with? So, there they are. Okay. What I would like them to leave with is is, is being your own medical advocate, uh, and that's taking charge of your health, pulling in the reins. Um, you do have control over a lot of things. And you have to feel comfortable with your doctor. You have to have good communication with them. And if you don't feel heard, you may want to go elsewhere. But it's about you taking control uh, and assuming responsibility for your health, uh, knowing what medicines you're taking, knowing your history. Uh, I have all my patients save all their labs, and they develop their own medical portfolio. But basically, my elevator speech is become your own medical advocate and to take control of your health. Yes, yes. And I just want to say, too, to add to it, I love what you're doing as a medical advocate as well. Um, that's why I'm so happy that you agreed to come on board uh, to work with us under our nonprofit dealing with, it's called Beauty Shop Stroke Screening and also uh, Cardiovascular and Metabolic because I have a, a, a machine that does a three-minute test. So uh, we have a test, yes, and what do we do after the test? You've seen a couple of those people right. that I sent to you. So it's really important that you know prevention is going to, I'm going to be, uh, the test at a, next month in March, and <laughs> the um, Pasadena winter, her event, and it's just so cheese calendar for those events at the end of the year. Let's get it done. WW Heartwise H E A book. It's Heartwise Fitness and Longevity Center, um, and we're in Whittier, and then I'm also in Santa Monica on Tuesdays. So um, feel free to call, inquire. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. And, um, and hopefully I'll have my book published this year. Yes, <laughs> and, and then I'll have you back. Right. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna, your book is going to be published this year because I already said mine would be uh, by May 4th okay. uh, for my friend's um, event, which is powerful. Um, so I just want to say that, you know, take the time to know you. Take the time to love yourself because when you love yourself, you are not stressed out. Just start doing some breathing exercises. That's one of the fastest ways to start bringing down your exercise. I mean, your blood pressure. If you're in the middle of a confrontation with somebody, you might say, you know what, let's get back with this later. Step away. People, I worked in, when I worked ER, they, they walk in there. You, you'll ask them, when did, when, when, you, when did you start feeling bad? When you were arguing with someone, when you're arguing with a family member or something, keep in mind that you, it's not that important. Walk away and go back to it later. You know, I've hung up with people and said, you know what, I love you enough and you seem to be upset. I'm going to call you back when you calm down. Or you call me back when you feel like you can talk. Mm -hmm. Because right now, I don't want to see anything happen to you. So take time for you. Love yourself. Definitely do those breathing exercises. In through your nose, out through your mouth for 20 minutes. You can lower your blood pressure down very fast. Drink some water and relax. Don't do that if you drive. You can do that even driving down the street. Just don't close your eyes. (laughs) Keep those eyes open. I just want to say that. Uh, each one, teach one is so important. This show is very dear to me because we don't have to be sick. We don't have to be sick. We don't have to suffer. That's one of my pet peeves right now. We don't have to suffer. I've been through a lot. Just had a birthday. Just turned 60 plus. Okay, 67. Mm-hmm. So I am grateful that I'm here and I'm just thankful. And people keep telling me I'm looking younger and younger because each time you go through something and you learn from it and you move on. You don't hold gl- grudges. Don't get into all of that self-hatred. And a lot, so many people do right now because of what's going on. Love your neighbor. Love yourself. Everyone take care of each other. If you don't have anybody to hug you, take time to hug yourself. Now, as I always in my show, what do I say? Repeat after me. You don't have to say that part, but repeat after me. And, and take this to heart. This is for you. I am... So grateful. So grateful. That I am. That I am. A magnet. A magnet. For miracles. For miracles. This is why I'm doing this show at UBN. Have a blessed day. Thank you. Join us every Wednesday live at 11 a.m. for a new Wellness TV with Dr. Lee. Remember, healthy mind, healthy body. Mm-hmm.